Greetings everyone, this is Dr. Ellen bringing you a special report on my experience going to Bali, Indonesia. Uh, the presentation for today is called The Wisdom of the Religion of Holy Water. And I'm doing this presentation from the context of Hawaii. I'm of Ilocano descent. I uh, was born and raised on the island of Maui in Hawaii. And growing up here in Hawaii, I learned a lot from the Kanaka Maoli Native Hawaiian people who very much revered their natural environment and their water, their aina, their land, because they see they saw it, they see it as an ancestor, as a family member, as a relative. And so being raised uh, in this kind of cultural value, I also have to think about who my ancestors are and where my family is from and we are from the Ilocos region in Luzon which is the northern island of the Philippines as you can see on this map here and I went to Bali Indonesia to learn more about the land and the water management practices um, in Southeast Asia and I understand that Bali which is this uh, island here the bottom part of this map is very far from Luzon but there's a history of this region being connected and that the peoples of this region is connected because of um, earlier times, ancient times, when this region was a larger landmass called Sundaland that has been submerged under the water due to the rising sea levels over time uh, from the last ice cap melting. This region was completely flooded, causing the dispersal of many peoples who um, have a shared culture, a shared uh, traditions, um, uh, shared farming practices, uh, and and it's because they have interacted as peoples trading, but perhaps as peoples who once lived in a shared continent called or a shared landmass called Sunda land. And so my my journey to Bali was to really deepen my heritage around. Uh, what it means to be of Southeast Asia because the Philippine national history has very much separated us from the broader Indonesian and Southeast Asian region and it's because of the history of colonialism that has uh, the Spanish and the Dutch have cre created cartography that we use to understand our political boundaries um, and have separated us but if you look deep into our traditions, our arts and our healing arts, you can see similarities in, in, in the types of practices that we have. And I was interested in following this connection um, and specifically looking at water management. And so why does this matter? And I'm speaking um, again from Hawaii and um, being part of different social movements that are concerned about the rise of militarism in the Pacific. Militarization is not something new to the Pacific that we have experienced various Western nations and even Asian nations like Japan uh, being imperial presences and utilizing our lands and our peoples as part of their uh, military base development and their trainings and their wars. And so peoples of the Pacific have been um, very much um, militarization is not something different or something new to us. Um, and so this map here is a picture of the military base infrastructure um, as a result of the U.S. policy of the Pacific Pivot, which is now advanced to the name Indo-Pacific Rebalance Policy, which seeks to increase U.S. military interoperability and preparedness in the Pacific by 2025. And so you can see here different zones. So the SCRC, the Southern California Range Complex, which comes out of San Diego, which projects U.S. military, Navy, um, our Air Force out into the Pacific. And here is the Hawaii Island Range Complex, which utilizes the whole Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument, as well as the main islands of Hawaii as part of military territory uh, for surveillance, for Navy, for any kind of base expansion. Oahu currently has 25% of military bases on the island, 
as well as Pohakulu on the Big Island is currently actively being used for Army training. You have here the PRI MNM, the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, which is a, uh, supposed to be like a sanctuary for endangered species and animals. But in times of national security, these lands can be transferred to the Department of Defense for various military strategy purposes. Similar, the Rose Atoll Marine National Monument, American Samoa in that region. Um, American Samoa is also a resource for the military um, in terms of using the bay there for naval purposes, as well as high recruitment of American Samoans into the military. You have also the Mariana Islands Training and Testing Area, which is a huge contested uh, situation where the Chamorro people are fighting against the use of their land, water, and skies for various weapons training and military base expansions. Um, and so the Mariana Islands, uh, Mariana Trench Marine National Monument is also subjected uh, to be transferred to the Department of Defense. Um, currently, it's under the Department of Wildlife, but if in the times of national security, it can transfer over to a different department for these war purposes. And to the farthest left, you can see Jeju, Okinawa, Subic Bay. These are other bases um, where the United States collaborates with the national governments of South Korea, with Japan, with the Philippines to maintain U.S. military presence, but often in collaboration with the national militaries. And this interoperability is really the uh, Pacific pivot or the inter Indo-Pacific rebalance policy in action to maintain U.S. military presence in the region, but also in cahoots with national governments. And so this summer is the rim of the Pacific exercises that will take place here in Honolulu and Pearl Harbor, where you have 26 nations participating in this exercise. Since 1971 is when RIMPAX first started, and this is a history. These 30 countries here is the various nations that have participated in RIMPAC. And so RIMPAC is really about the national militaries coming together to share and to learn the latest in military weaponry and um, um, you know, how to use these technologies and the newest ships and the newest Air Force carriers, uh, the newest technology in support for militarization under the guise of quote unquote mutual national security. Um, and so in our community, we see this kind of euphemism as hiding the history of uh, neoliberal capitalism that tries to use military to protect um, unsustainable multinational corporate economic development that is really about extracting natural resources for um, globalization and commodity development and how this type of development is highly violent. It uh, displaces people from their homelands, um, it exploits workers, and it destroys our natural environment. And so there is such a dire need for these peace movements to, to have a vision. If we do not want militarization, how else can we live? How else can we organize our societies? Fighting against militarization is such a difficult work because of the on, continuous ongoing onslaught and the dominant resources that this type of vision of development has, the monies that they have, uh, the, the resources that they steal from various abundant island nations and countries from around the world. And so we need to develop the willpower in people, the vision in people to see that there is another way and how do we educate people and inform people with visions of development that are based on genuine security, genuine peace, genuine harmony among different people, honoring different cultures, taking care of our environment, restoring our environment, allowing for forms of uh, food production that is not based on crop exportation, crop exportation, but it's based on learning how to use the environment to grow organic foods. You know, these types of work um, is really what we need to put our energy to, to show that we don't have to send our children to the military or we don't have to give up our lands for military base expansions. And so this research 
about Bali is really about finding the references on other ways that our societies in the history of humanity on this earth have used and in many places like in Hawaii, we still have knowledge about Ahupua. And I wanted to also see like in the Southeast Asian peoples, among Filipino peoples, among um, Indonesians and Balinese people, that they also have a similar tradition. Um, and specifically in Bali, uh, it is called the Agama Tirta, the religion of the holy water. So we have to understand that Bali is um, composed, there's indigenous Balinese peoples that come from the Malayo-Polynesian as well as the Austronesian peoples that have settled in the, what is now known as Southeast Asia. And they have had sort of an animist uh, relationship to the environment. Um, many of the, the practices of rice terrace farming that you see in um, Bali is also similar to what you might see in the Philippines, what you might see in South China. Um, and in specifically, the Balinese culture of their land management and water management practices has evolved uh, because of the different cultural influences that they've had from Hindu and Indian cultures and specifically Buddhism that has overlaid upon the indigenous Balinese culture. And then you also have the, the Islamic heritage that has affected most of the Indonesian region like Java and Sumatra, but it hasn't really taken a hold in Bali. And then, of course, you have the modern influences today that we'll go into. But within the Agama Tirtha, it is the religion of the holy water. And in this type of uh, cosmology and agricultural practice is the notion that water is sacred. And that water, because it is abundant on this mountainous island, uh, there's a, a major mountain crater that is called um, Mount Beratan, Mount Baratan. And it is a mountain that has many springs and has accumulated rainwater. And it's a big lake in the mountains that is the source of all irrigation throughout all parts of Bali that it flows down. And so because of this geological formation, the Balinese people have developed the belief system to believe in the sacredness of the water because it is so abundant, because it feeds their rice paddies and it allows growth and food. It grows their wealth as a people and it washes away physical and spiritual impurities. So the goddess of the mountain is called De Devi Danu, or the water goddess. And they've developed a whole social organization around honoring water. So they have a system where there are shamans that um, are important priests in these water temples that are placed strategically in different parts of this uh, water system. So at the top of the mountain, you have this um, Ulum Danun Bratan, this temple here that you see on the left, th that is where the shamans and the, the community and the priests give offerings to honor Devi Danu. And Jerogade is the earthly representative of Devi Danu, who's basically the shaman that helps to be the human communicator to the community about making decisions about how the water should flow, as well as sacred offerings and types of rituals. Um, and so from him, he is also, you know, allows the water to flow down to other parts of the irrigation, the river system to irrigate other fields. And this, this whole system is called the subak or the, um, the whole rice terrace, rice paddy uh, system. And so on the right here, you can see the, the sort of scientific um, irrigation, the engineering around their water system. So this gap here is where the water flows. And you can see one, this is like a diorama or like a, like a, um, just is sort of a demonstrative image, uh, structure to show how the water irrigation engineering is created. This is the main water flow here. Um, and then you have a rice paddy here and a rice paddy there. So depending on, you know, whatever types of, um, uh, how big the water plots are or the rice paddy plots are for specific families is the gap in which the amount of water will flow. So there's a, these gaps here 
here and here are also um, very uh, variable sizes or variable widths to allow certain amounts of water to flow through from these major streams, rivers, and tributaries. Um, and so th that will irrigate the rice paddies, as you would see here, in a very controlled manner. It's very much related to the subak, uh, such as the, the, the various temples that are located, as you can see in the background, there's a picture of the different temples at various levels of the streams, where the village leaders um, sit and sort of discuss how water shall be distributed. And um, an author named uh, Stephen Lansing wrote a book about this whole uh, water democracy, he called it, and how the traditional subak system is organized to align the people uh, with their environment um, and their uh, food system and their spirituality is all sort of wound or bound together in order to maintain the abundance of their uh, society and their natural environment. And the importance of ritual and giving thanks and offerings. And it's not sort of this rote activity that they give to just give religion and prayer, but it's really about the people thanking the natural environment because of the uh, amount of um, wealth and food and, and abundance that this naturally occurring element called water, you know, does for them, for their life. And so it's, it is sort of like this humbling um, human and nature balance where it's not about humans trying to dominate and control and take, but it's about the importance of the balance between humans being humble with their natural resources because of the blessings that it gives when you take care of it. So it's very much related, I think, to what I learned from Kanaka Maoli regarding the importance of taking care of the land. So I'm, a, I'm an archivist by training, and so I also look at the ways in which the knowledge systems of the Balinese um, helps to document this whole living system. So one of the things that I went to look in Bali is the lontar, which are palm leaf books, basically. So as you can see in Ayu, this is the lontar specialist that I met at Gidong Kircha, the, the lontar museum in Singaraja, Bali, which is the northern part of Bali. There is a museum there that preserves some of these old lontar that are that document various adat or laws. And so you can see in her hand, she's holding these lontar, which are basically palm leaves. If you look at a palm tree, you know, they have those very narrow leaves that are all sort of like, you know, spread up, you know, like sort of they fan out, right? So each of those leaves become a, a sort of like a piece of uh, um, flat surface that they boil in various kinds of medicinal herbs to help it become stiff and preservable over long periods of time. And the Balinese have a writing system that is based on an old Sanskrit um, and generally an old Javanese style um, that has been spread around because of the Hindu and Indian influence, specifically the Sanskrit writing system. And it's also important to note that this old Balinese language is very much related to Baibayan in the Philippines as well, in the style. Um, but of course, it has differed because of the different place that it has evolved. However, this is, so what's, what's written on these palm leaves is uh, different kinds of knowledge systems, agricultural laws, cosmological knowledge, the, the science of planting, um, astrology, medicinal knowledge, uh, philosophy, um, just different kinds of knowledges that would pertain to various domains in a, in a, a Baladi society. So whoever was a teacher or a guru or a, or a shaman would hold these lontar because it was sort of their documentation over the generations and how did their leader or their teacher or their practitioner do things from the past generation. They would write it down on these lontar leaves and they would be strung together by rope um, to make it into sort of this long, so these books in a sense, but they were um, interestingly put together as lontar leaves. Um, and so you can see the, the, the ways in which they had a documentation system to help pass down the knowledge of how to 
maintain the subak from the planting and to the uh, harvesting and the creation of the rice husks that would then be sifted and how that would shape the social organization of the households. As you can see on the right here, there's uh, images of different small houses. So this tall one here would be the storage of the grains that would then be pounded as, with this sort of this pestle that would create the rice pieces that would then be dehusked through the various kinds of shaking that we see with the with the flat disc type of um, palai uh, sifter. And then you have different houses that are also arranged according to certain feng shui principles where the temple would face towards the mountains because the mountains were seen as um, places of spiritual importance um, and more of the sort of the 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 um, the parts that was related to cleaning that's part to waste um, management would be at the bottom the southern part of the house to allow the sort of I guess the flow of waste out of the the buildings but it was an interesting way that the uh, the rice culture also played into the ways in which the 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 whole living complex of the Balinese would shape the living arrangements um, of the architecture of the urban planning of these complexes that would house families and then it could also expand to household towns and villages. Oh, another thing I wanted to mention too, I mean, the, the way that I'm talking about these um, rice systems um, is, is that it's very, very much familiar to what I learned um, in Pamati 2017 when we went to the house of uh, Lagitan in um, Ifugao territory in Baguio and he also taught us about using the the pestle the, to pound the palai or the rice harvest there and it would create the it would break the little rice grains from the plant itself and then we would use the sort of the sifting material um, the, the disc that we've used, like a flat sort of disc to dehusk it. And so this and similar actions and, and the use of the karabao was also very much common in, and is still common in Bali um, with as a manual type of technology to help them with the planting of the rice and to preparing the soil and things like that. And actually in the back picture here, you can see some terraces, uh, but this is actually from Ifugao. Um, territory in, in Baguio, in, in, in Cordillera Mountains. So this is where, again, I see the connections between Balinese and um, Philippine uh, agricultural practices. But we also can't rom romanticize um, that there is still challenges in Bali because of modernization. Um, in the 1970s, uh, the Indonesian government that manages Java, Bali, Sumatra, and other parts um, of like West Papua and different other islands in Indonesia. Um, the Indonesian government required the farmers no longer use the Subak traditional management system, but start to adopt chemical fertilizers. And even before that, the Dutch had changed the land tenure system so that it would be used, agricultural production would be used for cash crop exportation. So these kinds of changes in law and economy and um, governance really interrupted the traditional cosmological belief system that underlies the Suba. And today, Bali is a major tourist destination. Statistics such as about 10 million people descend on Bali every year because it's a major tourist destination. Um, because of all of these things, the culture, the environment. Um, and they have a lot of tourists that come from Australia, from other parts of Asia, China. Um, they have, of course, Americans and Europeans. Um, and the reality is that these outside currencies bring so much value to Bali and Indonesia in general because of the rupiah having lower currency value than, say, American dollar, euro, or the Australian dollar. And so tourism 
the development of roads, the development of hotels, businesses very much competes with the water needs of the Subak. And so my one of the drivers um, that I had that was a guide for me had really said that, you know, Bali is really trying to learn how to balance their cultural knowledge with modern situations today because a lot of the uh, younger generations are working for the tourism industry and being trained to work for the tourism industry um, and cultural the cultural knowledge ironically is also being somewhat preserved in museums in these kinds of packageable tourist destinations to get the information but it's of course devoid from the underlying context. I mean, I think that the people still have a desire to hold on to the spirituality and they still do, but the economic, the way that capitalism is creating a more transactional culture around consuming culture and promoting culture for tourist consumption rather than for a self-sufficiency with the land and a oneness with the land for the people to self-subsist. It's a whole different purpose which changes the uh, the culture and it changes the relationship between people and, and land and place. Um, and so I actually took these pictures. I took a photo of these contemporary arts that comes from um, a museum that I visited in Ubud. And um, I thought that they were very deep in what they were trying to express about the contemporary interpretation of Balinese artists with regard to what's happening to their culture, uh, the kind of sexualization of the Legong dancers you can see on the left as part of this commodity culture um, and the social media sort of selfie culture you know, it's very it's very telling of that sort of way in the prostitution of culture under tourism and then the middle one with the turtle buried in plastic trash is really telling about the pollution of modernity one of the things that i learned from another person that i met named zofi she talked about how the indigenous people of indonesia and of bali they would eat Everything that they consumed was wrapped in some kind of natural item, an organic item like a banana leaf or, you know, something that would be biodegradable. And so even though they would have these things, it would they would litter because it would eventually biodegrade. But now that everything is packaged in plastics, you know, the culture of littering is still happening, therefore causing this accumulation of trash in their environment. Um, and so there's a need, she talked about, to change the culture about littering, that we need to, that they, she said that they need to stop sort of um, kind of having that habit of just tossing things. But there's also a need to incorporate uh, recycling. And there's a, one of the other people I met, um, she was actually uh, the leader of a dance center called Mekarbuana Dance Center. And she's part of a program called Trash Hero, where they try to figure out better sustainable waste management for the island of Bali. And then the picture on the right here is really interesting because I interpret it as the industrialization of the sacred culture of Bali, where you can see the temples here on, here on these rollers, these big wheels, as if it's sort of being moved about you know and movable and placed anywhere and then you have these people that are holding this thing but it seems very industrial like they're all working in these cubicles right and and sort of carrying it and moving it and so i, I really do feel like they have the balinese people have a consciousness of how capitalism and tourism industrialization is affecting their culture and i think that just to watch, to see them process is really moving to me and it really made me think about what it was like for me to be a tourist in Bali um, and to really think about my effects and my impact and what I was participating in. And I think in the end, I do have concluding thoughts about 
um, decolonizing, decolonizing um, tourism. And so these are some of the things that I've been looking at here in Hawaii in terms of um, thinking about the labor movement and, and the tourism industry in the hotels and being a Filipino in Hawaii as a worker, as being of families that work in these hotels that are part of the prostitution of Hawaiian culture and lands and and then coming to Bali and sort of seeing that also, but being a tourist instead of being the worker, I think it really, um, I came away with this sense of how, you know, responsibility or, or how do I use that position in a different way. And I think that going to Bali was, again, not about escaping the problems that um, I come from in terms of being it from Hawaii, but really like going to Bali was about learning ancestral knowledge is about how do we remember how to take care of our environments um, how do we seek to learn the wisdom of peoples so that it transforms us it transforms me so that i come back to home to hawaii a different person so that i can learn how to solve the problems in my own place so that I can become inspired to have a sense of will and identity that isn't about just giving up in capitalism, but actually having now information to connect with and share with others that there are other ways to live, that there are other ways that we can imagine and build our communities and our societies uh, that is no not unsustainable, that we do have sustainable knowledge and practices in our own ancestral communities and lands. And I think that through this kind of learning that happens when we travel back and go home and do a luck by our journey back to our place where our ancestors have come from, and then we go back to our diasporic location, um, it is really to practice that interconnection and to help multiply this knowledge to more locations um, so thank you all for listening and I look forward to any thoughts you might have.